Bienvenidos, señores y señores, to another episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. All the major sports are in action this week with the college football playoffs ready to kick off. Bet Online is your number one destination for all your sports wagering info, including news for pro football, the NBA, upcoming fights, and NHL games this season. Head to the website today to get in on the action and see all the updated odds for the week. Remember to use the promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And joining us on the Carne Asada is an actor that probably a lot of you will recognize when you look at him because he's got a lot of great credits. He's got, And I'm talking to all you fans of CSI, CSI Miami, the Sons of Anarchy. I, I mean, that's just the TV stuff. I mean... It was so funny. I just watched um, uh, Bajo la Misma Luna under the same moon just the other day on uh, over Thanksgiving. And uh, cool. he's in that. You know him from Quinceañera, but I'm sure the majority of you guys know him from the major motion picture Flaming Hot. Ladies and gentlemen, bienvenidos to Jesse Garcia. Jesse, ¿cómo estás, amigo? Hey, what's up, man? So, Jesse, I want I want to start with this. I, this is the most fascinating thing for me, at least from your story, is you're from Wyoming. I'm yeah. a guy who's grown up in California, born and raised in California. All I know is the West Coast. I have a goal to try to hit all the states in the United States. And I'm sitting there going, how am I, why, what am I going to do in Wyoming? What was it like growing up in Wyoming? Um, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know how, how you felt when you were a kid, but for me, it was how, what can I do to get out of here? You know what I mean? It's like, you never really appreciate where you're growing up until you're, an adult and then now i'm like i'm looking for land somewhere in the mountains where i can have my own little plot with some 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 water and away from everybody and you know have a little have my own little sanctuary um you know there was not there wasn't a ton to do so we kind of had to entertain ourselves we you know we would blow sh stuff up with <laughs> you know firecrackers and i almost caught a field on fire once with the, the cotton from the trees I, thought it'd be fun to light one end and we, <laughs> um, um, all kinds of stuff. I mean, I would, you know, just kids, just, just getting in trouble, riding bikes, riding four wheelers, um, you know, whatever we could do that didn't cost money. So are you a, is it safe to say you're a wilderness person as opposed to a, a city, city folk? I'm a, I'm a hybrid man. I can, I can survive in both. I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, a survivalist. I can, I can, you, you plot me in the middle of the woods. I can, I'll probably be okay. Middle of the city, I'll be okay. And so let me see if I'm getting this right. Your father's from Durango? Um, I don't know where that's coming from. He's from Zacatecas. I've had that okay. a few different places. I don't know who, who, who thought or where someone got information from. A couple people told me that. Um, he has family. We have family down there, but he's uh, he says he's from Zacatecas. He says he's from Zacatecas. So have, do you... How many times have you been to the homeland? And do you remember the first time you went back to the homeland? Gosh, I was a little kid. Um, I have vague memories of, um, so my, my, my dad's mom, my grandmother on my dad's side, she, I remember the street. I can remember the street, the dirt roads, the adobe house that she had. Um, I remember like they had a, the, the stone was kind of like smooth, like made out of cement where we used to wash our own clothes. Um, like the little kitchen in the back. I remember the smell of just fire and, you know, the, the kind of pseudo porta potty toilet um, and just the dirt floors inside. You used to have to throw water on the floors on the inside of the house because there's no tile, there's no wood floors and no cement floors because that costs money, you know? So I remember throwing water on the floor to kind of keep the dust down. And <laughs> I remember those things, um, um, you know, and then my, different parts of Mexico, my same around, where was it? Um, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the town. I can't remember the name of the town now, but those like, they had like different, my dad's family's huge, like 15 brothers and sisters that we know of, you know, because <laughs> um, there are a lot of secrets in your family. Jesse. Bro, bro, there's so many secrets. I'm still trying to figure everything out. Um, you know, Mexicans, you know, uh, <laughs> Um, so we, you know, I remember the ranches. I remember, I remember, you know, they used to sell beans and corn that they would field. And I remember the corn drying out and how to shuck 
the corn with the uh, with a with a corn cob, how to do that and how to separate the beans. I used to put us to work like we we're little kids and like, all right, it's cool. Let's go sort the corn, sort the beans. Um, so I was uh, I remember that. I remember having to to fucking little corral that we still have to go dig a hole and shit in the dirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, the, the, I remember. I remember the prickly pear, the the tunas that we used to go. Yeah. Pick. But I also remember those would be a big cactus, like a big corral of cactus. But I also remember there's pigs in there. I'm like, you have to watch out for the pigs. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I was, I was like rural Mexico, man. Rural Mexico, going to the little tiendas to get some duvalin and some some masapan and like all the stuff around that's terrible for you. I, I'm always fascinated by that question because, you know, I, I'm Mexican-American and I, I think the culture shock didn't hit me until afterwards. So when I first went, you know, I had to go milk a cow and I was just traumatized that I was tugging on this uh, cows, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to hurt it and stuff like that. But what you're talking about, too, when I had to go to the corner store and I had to bring an empty bottle in order to get a drink, I couldn't like if I didn't have an empty to yeah. I, I wait, or they would pour it in a little glad bag, and I'm just like, "What's going on?" And it was later on when I came back to the states. I think it was when I watched that famous scene in Selena, where you know Edward James almost says, "You got to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more American than the Americans." And that's the first time that it hit me that I'm just like, mm -hmm. for the longest time, I called myself a Mexican, and I was like, "No, I am a Mexican American because." Uh, there are parts of my Americanness that I, uh, I I deny, and I'm like, it is clear when I go to Mexico, they all clearly know I'm an American, and they call me Johnny. I come oh, back to the United God. States, I'm not Juan. I'm like, hey, what's up, Juan? Do yeah. you? I mean, were how cognizant were you of your identity growing up, or did it was never a factor because you're in a business where you get put into a box and we're going to yeah. get into it when we talk about flaming hot, but um, were you aware of any of that? I don't know. Um, what I can't, what I can say is that, you know, as a kid, I, young elementary school and younger, cause I hadn't, I hadn't, we had, we didn't go back uh, to Mexico as a family for, like 30 years, you know, um, my dad used to go a lot and my parents divorced 20 some years ago. And so like, by that time I was out of the house and, and, um, you know, I was living my life. Um, but I remember learning Spanish as a kid, catching on to it quicker. And then as an adult, like as my, we didn't speak it in the house and none of my friends spoke it. So, and it was almost, you know, like I didn't want to speak it. It was kind of a weird thing. Cause I, but for some reason I, I got picked on a lot as a kid too. So it has something to do with it. Like I, I wanted to assimilate and kind of like blend in and mm -hmm. I didn't really want to stick out and anything that I felt like if I stuck out, they're going to pick on me for four is like kids are messed up, man. Um, uh, I didn't really, I, I didn't really the identity like that really wasn't a, a thing until kind of starting in high school and then a little bit more, not really much in college because I went to university, uh, University of Nebraska, and then a smaller college, Eastern Wyoming College, where nobody cared either way. Uh, and then I moved to LA in 2003, December of 2003. And I, and when I was in Atlanta for three years, and from 2000 to 2003, I started to try, I, I sought out Latinos, in it, but I couldn't, I didn't really, I couldn't really, there wasn't a big community, right? There was some, but I wasn't, I, there weren't none in acting classes, and there wasn't, you know, my friend circles were black and white. Um, um, so I couldn't, I couldn't find it. And then I moved to LA and I'm like, I really like this drive to figure out kind of like my culture, my background. And, um, and it wasn't until I did a movie called walkout with Edward James, almost about the 1968 high school walkouts that I really started to dive in so like to get to know some stuff through my friends and kind of do my own research. This and this is the internet existed, but it was still kind of like in this, you know, pubescent stages, you know, um, I'd watch videos and stuff, uh, um, but that was kind of when I started to really dive in. I, I called my mom one time and I don't remember when it was probably 20, 30 years ago. I called my mom, uh, to go, okay, what, what, you know, what are we? And she goes, what do you mean? I go, what are, what am I? What are we, what are you? And she goes, Spanish. I go, 
okay, Spain Spanish or Mexican Spanish? Because <laughs> people be saying Spanish for everything. Uh, and she goes, well, I don't know. I go, well, how do you not know? So I called my one of my her sisters, one of my aunts. That was, and I think we have indigenous stuff on that side too. It's kind of mysterious. And my my aunt goes, I don't know what what why. I go, I just want to know who I am. And then I call my grandma on my mom's side, and she goes, uh, I go, Spain Spanish to Mexican Spanish. She goes, I don't know. Why do you want to know? I'm like, I, I just want to know. Like, how does nobody know? You know what I mean? And then my 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 mom's dad says Spanish and I had to keep asking him like Spain Spanish Mexican Spanish she goes Spain like from Spain like from Europe yes uh um and they're from New Mexico there's a lot of Spanish people in New Mexico Spain Spanish people in New Mexico my dad's obviously from Mexico um but my dad's kind of side's kind of mysterious too because he's kind of lighter skinned greenish eyes my sister got the light skin and green eyes um I look like a hybrid between my mom and my dad darker skinned brown eyes black hair um, so it's, the whole thing has been very interesting to me. So, and even 23 and me, I don't really believe it either. I'm indigenous Mexican and mostly Spanish. No, I mean, it, it, it is interesting. I, I buried the lead though, because I did want to start with this. You mentioned you went to the university of Nebraska. Is this true that you went to the university of Nebraska on a scholarship for cheerleading? Yeah. Now, yeah. what I appreciate is your honesty. Did you do that just to meet chicks? hundred <laughs> percent. I'm gonna lie. I, so the, how I got into that, I was um, uh, I was a football player, wrestler, and uh, I ran track in in high school. Didn't really care about track. Literally just did track to hang out with girls. Couldn't care less about any of the events. Uh, wrestling I, I really liked. Football I loved. Um, but I was small. I was like 155 pounds, and I was playing a lineman. I was a lineman. It was a completely the wrong position. Um, but one of the before the senior year started, the, the coaches took us to a University of Wyoming football game and we saw the cheerleaders warming up and I was I was watching them. Of course, like cheerleaders hot, but they're stunt doing stunts. And like I go, oh, man, I could do that. And cheerleading coaches next to us, she goes, you know, they get scholarships for that. Right. I'm like, get out of here. It's like maybe, maybe I should quit football and wrestling and be a cheerleader. I was joke with her throughout the year. Um, I didn't, of course. Uh, one wrestling tournament high school uh, my senior year the cheerleading coach called the eastern wyoming college cheerleading coach and kind of told her like hey we got this kid he's been joking around about it but i think he'd be good you know and i was scrawny it was wrestling it was scrawny like 150 pounds or something um uh not that there's anything wrong with 150 pounds uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> i wish i wish i was there again <laughs> um uh and I go, this is, I, I, I would love to talk to you. It's be kind of fun, but let me finish my tournament and I'll give you a call in a couple, like a couple weeks or a month or something. I set something up uh, toward the end of the school year. I went and tried out like hour into the tryouts. I'm doing a couple things. I'm catching some things. And, and she goes, oh, no, you, you're really, you're catching on very, really quick. Do you, if you want a scholarship, you know, you, you're, we're offering you a spot on the squad, like very, very quickly. I'm like, yeah, dope. I'm, I'm down. Let's let's do it. And so I have two years at Eastern Wyoming College as a cheerleader. And then I sent this tryout tape to probably 10 schools. And I got on the squad in all of them. So I, was like, I think there was this was like random one in Utah, Hawaii. I think I made the squad, but the scholarship was terrible. And then I the very last second, I was going to go to University of Wyoming just because it was easy. Uh, but I got a call at the very last second at, from the University of Nebraska saying, hey, we like your tape. We think you're great. Um, can you be here tomorrow? I'm like, no, nope, but I can be there Saturday. Uh, that was two days from now. Um, so I went down and and had a great time. Stayed there for uh, a year and then uh, almost full ride. I, in fact, I made money to go to school with the random grants and scholarships I got on top of it, which I have no idea how I got some of those. I just think, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to fight it for your money. <laughs> Uh, so I'm one of the lucky ones that went through three years of school with zero debt. Wow. Uh, look, things worked out for you. Great. But is there ever a part of you? Do you ever ask yourself if I followed athletics, like maybe pursued football in college? I, I know you say you're small, but there's a lot of small receivers out there, small running backs. I should have I mean, ran the ball. I, every time I ran the ball in practice, I, I was really good. And it was, it was tough to take me down, but 
I don't know. I, there's a fear mentality. Like I wanted to play and there was a couple, there's a handful of running backs. I'm like, they're bigger. I mean, it was like a weird thing. If I go back and do it again, I would run the ball. Continue. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, that's great. So obviously in Wyoming, then everything is football driven over there. I mean, is baseball, does baseball have any popularity out in Wyoming? Not really? I mean, there's one of those sports where th there's just not enough teams kind of, there's not enough schools. It's, it is a thing, but it's like private leagues, you know, like town, town leagues or something like that. I mean, um, does one university of Wyoming might have a baseball team. I don't know. Um, I know they have golf. I know they have tennis, I think. So I'll, gymnastics, I'm, they probably have a baseball team. Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I probably, if, if anything, I would have done soccer. Yeah. I would have done fo football. There you go. Football. So, I mean, you've bounced around. You you went from Wyoming. You went to Atlanta. Like this show, we're obviously, we're about the Dodgers, but we're also about LA, Los Angeles, and we're about La Cultura. I'm always curious to hear people's first perception of when they land in Los Angeles, because if you're not from Los Angeles, you hear those stories. Ah, it's Hollywood and stuff like that. When you showed up in Los Angeles, did you immediately recognize, hey, that's all bullshit? Or did you sit there and go, oh, this really is what I everybody told me it was going to be? So, so my very first time here. I came with my friend's family. It was like, I think it was a, uh, 17, 18, um, 18, maybe, uh, for like a, like a holiday trip. Right. So like it might've been new year's, it might've been something. So I, I think her, my friend's family lived in Rancho Cucamonga and we stayed out there with them, but we came in to town to kind of hang out. I was 17 or something like that. I mean, we were def definitely, too young to be out by ourselves and partying and racing. Like we went to street races. Like I could have, it was dumb. Like what we were doing is dumb. You were doing fast and the furious shit out there in Rancho. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was stupid. Um, um, dumb kid from Wyoming coming out, hanging out at the street races, almost wrecking my friend's parents car. Um, they don't know this, <laughs> um, but I had a great time. Uh, and then, the the my the one time I did my the first time I did it I came on my own was probably two thousand one or two, uh, just to come out and visit a buddy. As soon as I got off the plane, I'm like, oh wait, this is this is home. Like the second I got off the plane, it was like one of those things. Atlanta never felt like home. Like I love Atlanta, and Atlanta's great, but it just never felt like home. I sp I spent two three and a half year, years there working, uh, doing classes, stop like kind of figuring myself out. Um, from like 20 to almost like 20 to 24, something like that. And then, uh, but as soon as I landed the first time, I'm like, okay, I'll be here. I'll be here soon. And I came right away. Like, I, I, and as soon as I got here, I drove into town. It took me two days. I drove two days from Atlanta to LA, less than Damn. two days. I was cruising. Um, I got here. I found a ha an apartment on Craigslist. And it was the couch. I was renting the couch for 400 bucks a month. Um, my buddy came and checked out the apartment to make sure it was fine. And it was like the, the, the roommate was great. And I stayed with her for five or six months or something like that. On the couch, I bought some doors from Home Depot and kind of made my own wall and kind of sectioned off this living room for myself. Um, and uh, yeah, it was like I hit the ground running. And, I, you know, it's like you the first time you come here, you're like hoping to see movie stars everywhere and and all that, uh, I didn't see that, but I kind of like, it still felt like home. And I, you know, LA, it's it's not, it looks prettier at night than it does during the day. You know what I mean? Like it's a little shinier at night, the lights, you know, depends where you go. Um, um, it's, you know, I, I don't know that what people think they want to see. It is. I did. And I've always said it. LA is what is. It will be what you make of it. Mm -hmm. You know. So have you been able to discover the majority of it? Because you know everybody just focuses on Hollywood, but there's the East Side, there's the South Side, there's the West Side, and there are pockets of Los Angeles yeah. that you're just like, what? This is. I'm still in LA here. Yeah. Have you been able to do that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been. I've been everywhere. Uh, I've lived in, I've lived in West Hollywood. That was my first spot. I've lived, and then I went to Koreatown 
for a year or so. And then I moved to Silver Lake. And then I've been on the West Side for the past 15 or 16 or something like that years, all over Venice, um, Santa Monica, multiple places in Venice now, and Mar Vista, all like all throughout the whole West Side, Marina del Rey. Um, but it's West Side's where I'm at now. But I've 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 ventured all over. You know, you got to you got to go all over. I didn't. I've spent time like to go to parties or to an event or to go. Uh, you know, the different spots have different kind of cool old school hip hop nights and you know <laughs> different art shows and different events. L.A. is one of those spots. It's just it's it's very different from somewhere like L.A. I'm sorry, New York, where you can just you can hop on a train and get somewhere and, and there's people everywhere. It, it's a it's a little bit more effort to kind of. Yeah. go out and do something here you have to organize and make sure you know you're probably going to be an hour in traffic and <laughs> be okay with it and um it's it's a different animal for sure absolutely so i i want to get into the flame and hot uh conversation so um flame and hot it was i think it was at this point it was at least in the top 10 streaming i think everywhere when it was released um before I get into the whole movie itself, I want to talk to how you got involved with it because I heard in another interview and I, I just, I wish I had your tenacity. It seemed like you just went out there, found whoever was casting this and was like, I can play this part. And you hear those stories, but then it's always like, yeah, you're full of shit. Get out of here. We're going to get somebody who's a more established name. I've, I've heard so many actors who are great actors and they're losing parts because they're, they're not a big enough name or whatever. They can't, they don't sell territories in, in Europe or, or stuff like that. That kind of confidence. Is that true? Is that what you did? You got a hold of that script and you were like, this Ish. is my part. Ish. Yeah. Part of the story is right. I think I, it, two, I think there's two stories being uh, kind of mixed up, mixed together. Okay. So when I, when I first moved to LA, I was on uh, all the websites actors access i think now casting was one back then um I, everything i was submitting myself to everything and uh, and then i came across one i don't remember what it was on about this little movie non-union movie uh, that they were casting and i recognized the casting director's name who i had done a casting workshop in atlanta a couple of years prior his name was jason wood and i emailed him like hey have you Jesse from the Atlanta workshop. He goes, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, Have you found the lead guy for this yet? And he goes, no. And I, I brought me, he brought me in, and then I brought for a callback like the a few days later to meet the directors, and then I basically got it that afternoon or the next day. And that movie was Quinceanera, mm -hmm. so that one I chased down. Um, but for Flame and Hot, uh, at this point I've been in LA for twenty years, 12, 18, 18 years, and um, I had heard about Richard's story probably through the trades or an article or something like that. And I always thought I'd make a cool movie or TV show. And whoever got the part would it's going to play him as it was like a dream role. Um, and I got the casting, or I got the uh, audition from uh, my manager, my agent, and, and I saw that it was Richard's story and that Eva Longoria was directing it. And that my, my friend Carla Hool was casting it and, and as soon as I started reading, I go, oh, this is, this is written for me. This was, I can do all of this. And it's not anywhere, it's like, it's all in my wheelhouse. Every, I can do all the beats. I can do the comedy, the drama, the action, the, the intense stuff. I can do all. The lovely, the tenderness, like everything. I go, I can do this. It's not, it's, it'll take a little bit of, what I had to do, my, the homework that I had to do is, you know, do my very best tapes, my very best auditions and let them catch up to me, to what I thought that I was the best guy for the role. And I knew every, and there was so many of my friends who would text me or call me or message me and say, hey man, I don't know if you've read for this, but I just got done taping for this movie called Flame and Hot, you should make sure you tape. And it's normally, there's a few of us that will make sure we everyone reads for the same part because hopefully it's, it's gotta be one of us, mm -hmm. right? We want it to at least be one of us. Um, and, uh, and um and and at that point there was it was more people than would normally be in that circle like i people that i didn't know was texting my friends go hey if you don't know jesse jesse should read for this 
uh, and, and at that point I had already been like two or three steps into it and I was getting really close. Um, and I, you know, and I knew everyone had to go through the process and I knew casting in the studios and, and like this, at that point, 20 years in the business and I had done a bunch of work up to that point and people knew who I was, but you know, I'm still I'm not a household name and I had to go in there and prove myself and, and, and just do my best work. And, hopefully things came out. And by the time I left the audition process, I had emptied the tank, right? I gave everything and I, I gave all my tricks. I gave, followed all the directions, added some spices here and there, kind of like did my, my flavors. And uh, I mean, luckily it went my way. You know, it's funny, Jesse, you say you're not a household name, but I mean, how does it feel? You are on a list now that if a role calls for a Latino, I mean, you know what whether this is a good thing or a bad thing it seems here's the same group of actors you know that are going to be up for these parts i mean how does it feel to know that now hey when a part like this comes up you're one of those people that are going to be considered for it i mean it's great it's, i mean 23 years in it's about time you know like I, I don't i don't know what happened you know 17 years ago i kind of fell off after quinceanera but in, I had to I had to get to this point, you know, the universe said, no, yeah, I wasn't ready or the world wasn't ready or maybe maybe another me in a different multiverse is, you know, a multimillionaire and has a massive movie star, complete drug addict or well, who knows, you know what I mean? But in, this, in this timeline, the, they go, you're not ready until right now. So it's great. Like I, my 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 uh, uh, for me, it's like. I had a friend, I was talking to a friend one time when all the billboards and everything were going up around, around LA. And it's like, it's a very cool moment, right? So to, to, to really massive billboards and like the ones on the LED screens and they were downtown and, um, and uh, on sunset and like just some root, like stuff that you, you know, you dream of, like the stuff that an actor dreams of, a filmmaker dreams of. And one of my friends goes, this is crazy, man. Who'd, who'd, who'd have thought? And I looked at him, I go, me. <laughs> I, I thought that like i don't put limitations on myself like i manifested this sh stuff i i've been working for this you know what i mean like this is if you don't think it and you don't work toward it then it, then it is impossible and it wasn't like i've always said this is it'll happen it'll happen i don't know when it's going to happen i don't know to what magnitude but like i i thought i thunk it you know what i mean like this is this is me going for this it's like and 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 they go huh I guess I never really thought about it that way. It's like, yeah, man. If you don't, if you don't believe in yourself more than everybody else, then 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 who are you going to fault? So is that what is that how you could relate to the character of Richard? Because I I see similarities here. I I mean, who knows? I I don't know off the top of my head how many years before Richard and the Flaming Hot actually hit all the work that he put into it. But you just, I mean you're describing a lot of patients. You've been doing this, you know, for 20 years, but you know that that moment was going to come. And you are like, when is that moment going to come? How, I mean, are you a patient person? How easy is it? I mean, have you had moments of doubt where you're just like, man, what, what am I doing? This is just, it's, it's too much of a grind. hundred percent, man. Like there was, um, there's been moments where I, I, I came off of, uh, Dang, several. Um, I did a I did a couple movies right after right after Quinceanera. Mm -hmm. um, one was kind of a bigger budget action movie that was Wilmer Valderrama, Tay Diggs, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Lawrence Fishburne, Amber Valletta, a bunch of rappers. Uh, and it's a good movie, and it just didn't come out. And that movie, if it would have came out, would have done huge things for me. It would have done big things for Wilmer. Uh, and of course, Jeff, he's a, you know, he's a big star, um, uh, but it didn't come out. And then a couple of smaller movies, they, nothing happened with them. And I'm like, oh, for some reason I fell off and, uh, and, and, you know, it's like new folks started coming up and new folks started when like getting wins and getting projects and getting movies and TV shows. And, and for whatever reason, I kind of stopped working. And, um, and then I caught a little, started working again a little bit and, um, and then again, then I went kind of broke and I was couch surfing and, and, and relying on some friends to kind of keep me afloat while I was, you know, still doing a guest star here and there and, uh, um, making a little bit of money 
subletting my apartment while because I couldn't afford to move out of my apartment either. Because if I moved out of my apartment, it's like, where am I going to put all my stuff? And so I was subletting my apartment just to make a few bucks at the end of the month where I can throw one of my friends a few bucks to help let me stay on the couch and get enough food and for me and my dog. And, you know, I was like, like I was scraping the bottom. Um, and then, and then, you know, I started getting on my feet, kind of finding my own hustles and different things. And then I got from dust till dawn, from dust till dawn, we worked on for three seasons. And after that got canceled, um, I didn't work for like almost two and a half years. I did a couple of small things, but for two and a half years, I'm like, wait, man, like, am I done? It's like, is this, is this it? You know? So like I had to, you know, really kind of talk myself out of it and, 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 um, um, and get back, you know, I eventually talked to myself out of it and got back on the grind and started figuring out how, what, okay, what do I got to do now? It's like, I change up to my, how I, I do my auditions and change up, like, what else can I be doing as a filmmaker? What else can I be doing to, to perfect my craft or grow? And I started coaching and I started doing a couple other things. I started teaching myself different methods and studying different stuff. And eventually I, I got Narcos, which, you know, paid for, paid for the bills for like a year and a half. And uh, it wasn't a big paycheck, but it was a cool gig. Um, and then I started getting a couple of small things here and there. And one project I, I booked a uh, ghost rider, which is, which was a Marvel series that ended up being pulled at the last second before you even got this chance to shoot it. Um, so it was, you know, some, some heartbreaks here and there. And, and then, and then the pandemic hits, you know, uh, mm-hmm. nobody, nobody works for a year. And, uh, I just booked a massive Audi campaign that w- Audi was it Audi? Yeah, it was an it was an Audi campaign, and it didn't air. And I thought, okay, this campaign's gonna air, and and I'll be fine for the year. At least I'll make you know 50, 60, 70 grand. I'll be okay. I make insurance. I'll be good. It didn't air because it was supposed to air during the NBA finals. You know, so like, oh. so didn't make any money there. Uh, and, and then you know, just kept grinding. Like I decided I wasn't gonna let the pandemic bring me down. I was, you know, still working on a couple of different things of my own, like writing some stuff, which I'm still doing. And started getting some auditions and, you know, booked a, booked a small part in Snowfall. And then I, after that, I got Ambulance. And then from Ambulance, I went to, I got an offer for a smaller indie movie. Uh, gosh, what's the name of it? We've changed the name so many times, but with Amy Redford, she directed it. Um, and then I got Flamin' Hot. And then Flamin Hot from Flamin' Hot, I we shot that. Then later on, I did a pilot that never went. And, and, and then then I started The Mother. So like 2021 was an epic year. And like 2022, everything started coming out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then 2023 is, you know, we're, we're here and we're off to the races and trying to get that next level. You know, you mentioned, you gave me already two examples, a movie that never gets released, Ghost Rider, not, not, not filming. Look, there's a lot of good movies and there's a lot of competition out there. I mean, movies are getting released at at least back before the pandemic. There were so many movies getting released every week and it's really hard for people to see everything. Yeah. So how do you get people to watch your stuff? When you first heard, or did you already know going into Flaming Hot that it was going to go to streaming? How did you feel about Flaming Hot being streamed as opposed to being released in a theater? Um, I mean, mixed feelings. I think the strategy there was that it was better to have. Look, we didn't. It's. Uh, we don't have the luxury of failing, mm-hmm. right? We don't have the luxury. And by of we, who are you, who are you talking about, yeah, Jesse? Like, you know, don't have the luxury of failing. Like we don't. We just don't have that many chances. It's just it's just the reality of it. Um, and because there's not very many. I mean, this this year has been luck. It's been year's been lucky because it seems like there's been a lot, but it's just been more, right? Yeah. So we've had we've had Blue Beetle. We've had a million miles away. We had uh, Radical. Um, there's a couple other ones that I'm not thinking. Of. And then the, the TV projects too. Wednesday. Um, uh, there's a couple other ones. Um, yeah. So there's been some movement, the screen movies, uh, some movement in with Latinos as leads, but it's still not a lot. You know what I mean? So we didn't have we didn't have the we didn't have the luxury of failing. And the strategy, I think, part of it was is like if 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 the movie succeeds in the streaming, 
uh, if we thought if we released it in theaters and it didn't make much money, it would be counted as a fail, right? But if right. we streamed it and it was a hit on streaming and went, got some really great numbers in streaming, it, it works. The, the the strategy works. It's a it's a hit and it's a it's a win, um, and it works with the, the advertising and it works with all the things, right? Um, it plays really well in the theater. We've done so many theaters. It looks beautiful in the theater. The cinematography is amazing. Sound, everything. It just looks great in a the theater. Um, and it plays different. Like you watch it at home, whatever size TV screen you have, most people have a really big one uh, at this point. But when you're in a the theater with a bunch of different people experiencing the same emotions, it magnifies, right? It's just a different experience. Um, I would have loved to have seen it in the theaters. and. Um, but you know, next one. Is there still a stigmatism that we're fighting in terms of streaming? Because there's a lot of quality work that you can watch on, on streaming. But I just feel, like you said, everybody wants to see their movie up on the on the big screen. Is there a stigmatism that somehow, oh, because it's streaming, oh, the studio didn't have faith in it, or it's not worthy to be put on the big screen? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think. Uh, <sighs> I think there is a lot of really great streaming movies and television shows that if you were to throw them on a big screen, it's just a different experience, right? Yeah. There's not, there's, there's still the, the, uh, what am I, the, the prestige of being on a big screen. It's like the bigger than life, right? Yeah. 30, like my massive 30 foot head. Um, it's just a different experience, but it's more uh, accessible and more people can watch it on your screen at home and also like you know some families just don't have the time to go spend 150 bucks and taking the whole family and buying popcorn and buying candy and parking and and all the things you know if it's if you're going to rent it, it's going to be five ten bucks or 20 bucks or whatever it is to buy it and at the end of the day it's it's nice to be in a theater but it's streaming and breaching what happened with with flame and hot is because it did screen so well in south by when we premiered we got to premiere not only uh, on hulu but we got to go on disney plus and disney plus is worldwide right so we got mm -hmm. to reach a massive audience at the same time and this was the first time that any show or movie has been able to platform on both network uh, both streamers at the same time that, that's uh i'm glad you pointed that out i don't think enough people take that into account um congratulations on your win for best actor at the imagen awards uh we just recently lost norman lear who uh, is the who created the imagen awards who was real a real ally to the latino community um it's that time of year jesse where awards are coming out and people are doing the circuit they're promoting their movies they're you know, it, it is one of those things. I think Godard was the one that said it. Half of it is making the movie. The other half is promoting and selling the movie. Is there a campaign set up? Is Fox or I mean, I guess at this point it's Disney, right? Are, are they getting behind you guys or is this just too little too late uh, for you guys to be pushing you guys for awards yeah. consideration? Um well, we are campaigning. We're we're doing we're doing screenings. We have a bunch of screenings coming up for for Ampus, for Studio, for for, uh, for Academy. We're still we're still in the mix. Um, we're, we're hoping people come out for that. Where we got some SAG nom stuff still available. Um, we we didn't get in for Golden Globes or, or Critics Choice, um, but it, you know it is what it is. Um, so we're kind of there's and, and Eva still up for. You know, this she's still in consideration for DGA for director's uh, award. Um, so there's still some there's still some bigger awards that we're kind of going for. And and, and we're just hoping people come out and um, voters just watch. You know, that's all we can do is ask them to to watch and and consider for your for our consideration. How do, is, does the promotion come easy to you? Is it easy for you to go do junkets or is it easy? Do you get self-conscious when you're sitting here basically love us, love us, give us awards when you're taught, right? As an artist, it's, it's about the work and the work should speak for itself. Well, the thing is, is like as an artist and I, I, I enjoy watching other people's junkets just to kind of get little nuggets or little funny things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you're doing, it, it can be a grind, you know, and we get to do it like and we, you know, Eva and Annie and I 
we'll be sitting with each other and just dog tired from answering usually the same questions over and over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, but we go, no, we asked for this. This is what we want. You know what I mean? Like we're, we, we have to treat this like, um, it's a privilege, you know, it's a privilege to be there. We don't always like it. It may, it may not be the most fun all the time. Um, but it's, we asked for it. This is, this is, we've been, I've been working 23 years to get to this moment. I asked for this and for me to complain about something like this, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like this is, I, I get to be a part of something that very few actors get to do and very few, few filmmakers get to do. And, and for, to be a part of something that's, um, you know, that's, that's making a huge impact in the film business and in our community. So I get to do this. I, I, this is an honor and a privilege for me. Like I, if I get to go out and inspire other filmmakers and other actors and especially other, other, you know, of, of the Latino community, um, that's great. Cause I didn't, you know, I had a few people to look up to, but now that there's a lot more people in, in the business and looking, getting there, the amount of grown men that come up to me, just everyday folks that go, dude, I, fucking, I cried my eyes out watching this movie you know what i mean like i was sitting his wifeys or boyfriends girlfriends like yep yeah he did and it's like they're, they're not usually emotional like that so to have a movie that has been this impactful for so many people is, it's really special i i, I wanted to ask you because it, I, I didn't know if this is true you guys got about what three or four weeks of rehearsal time for this movie kind of we had a lot of prep what we did is we had a lot of prep it wasn't a lot of rehearsal we had a few like maybe three maybe three days or so we ever went we went over stuff um and uh, eva and i talked about a lot of stuff annie and i have known each other for a while so we kind of hung out and talked about a few things um but it was a lot of prep so like those we got there so early because we had to go over four decades right like mm -hmm. my look was four decades long it was 70s 80s 90s and and current um so it was a lot of wigs. It was a lot of like the prosthetic uh, mustache because we had to keep going back and forth. I would change my wig, my look sometimes once, maybe twice a day. So I was in a makeup chair with my team uh, all day long. They were up poking and prodding me and make sure the wig looks good and kind of you know, the lace isn't showing and my costume looks great. And so it was a lot of prepping. Um, we didn't really rehearse for three and a half weeks. We prepped for three and a half weeks and there was rehearsal within that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but anytime new actors would come into town, getting ready to shoot that week, we would use one day on the weekend to kind of run through things and kind of like this way when we're on set because we shot so fast. We had shot so much material so fast. We shot on a TV schedule and on a TV schedule, like there's you have seven to 10 days, whatever the show is to get the episode done. That's all you get, right? And you have to shoot everything fast, and that's how we shot it. Shot this like there was very few days where we were we're going to concentrate on just one scene, or one part of one part of the movie. It was like we're shooting six, seven, eight, eight scenes that day. Um, so we had to be on point. Everybody, everybody, every day. Wow. I, I mean, looking back at that whole experience, um, one of the. I want to remind people that this is not a documentary, that this is a movie and that it is ten entertainment. And so there were those stories that were coming out saying, well, this isn't necessarily true that he didn't do all this stuff. And it, there were reports and you ver verify this for me that you guys had to change the script. Um, when that happens, do you get caught up in all of this? Does it change your approach to be like, well, well, what are we doing here? I mean, if you set your mind that you're going to make this movie and then all of a sudden you got to make changes to the script that's going to change things for you, doesn't it affect how you plan out your performance? No, I think if you have to, if you, you have to remember that this movie is in, in, from Richard's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. This is his story. Like right. We aren't telling it. We aren't shooting a documentary. We aren't, you know, trying to get every single detail right. This is his perspective of the story. Um, um, we, it's in the movie like they were the, they were working on a hot chip in the middle and uh, in, in one of the middle America factories that just didn't work. Um, and what what the CEOs loved, what Enrique loved about Richard is his ability to sell to the, the Hispanic market, the Latino market. And the chip was a bonus. Right. And he has he's shown us pictures and of the bags of the different kinds of chips that he was had pitched at the same time. Like there was like. A bonello. There was like a like a 
cinnamon and sugar. There was really? like, he had a handful of them, and the hot chip was like, all right, let's let's do this one, right? Which became to like the most popular chip on the planet. Um, billion dollar billion dollar snack. Um, so that none of that stuff, and, and I talked about all that stuff with Eva, and like none of it, like we're like we're not worried about any of that stuff, and mm -hmm. all of it got debunked anyway. And like there's plenty of information showing that you know he was in the room, and then and and all the things and richard's told that story a million times and and people who've known richard came to some of the screenings you know to to corroborate, corroborate his story and 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 validate what what we're what we're saying again it's, it's not a it's a movie you know what i mean we're telling his perspective of the story there's, there's fantasy elements in there and we're not didn't shy away from anything um um but it's you know relax well, we're, we're going to wrap things up on the show the way we normally wrap things up, Jesse. Uh, on this show, uh, we like to do a, a series of rapid-fire questions that we like to refer to as our kickback questions. If you want to give a longer answer, by all means, go ahead and do it. Um, there's a, there's a begin In the beginning of the movie, there's a wonderful sequence where both you and Annie are living that cholo life. <laughs> how, how aware were you of the cholo life before you made Flamin' Hot? So growing up in a small town in Wyoming, everybody in my town leaned west, right? We were west coast. Uh, we we were fascinated with the cholo life. Like everyone had, like people had the cheap, the Walmart versions of Pendletons, you know. Uh, uh, some people probably had the real ones, but uh, we def I definitely didn't. I couldn't afford it. Um, but baggy clothes, you know, the music, everything. So I was. I was definitely aware of it. It wasn't something that I, I was coming into it brand new. Um, so, oh yeah. Um, you were. You said you were a wrestler in high school. We are all fans of the male soap opera on this show, referred to as professional wrestling. <laughs> were you at any time? We say WWF. I know that it's now WWE. But yeah. At any time, were you a fan of? WWF, WCW, and if you were, who were some of your favorites? Oh man, it was um, from old school. I remember, uh, uh, well, Sting was definitely one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Ultimate Warrior. Um, gosh, what are the names? Um, uh, uh, what are who are the dudes that always wore the Raiders stuff, or like they had the spikes. the Road Warriors or Road the Legion Warriors. of Doom? Legion of Doom. Yeah. Um, Hulk Hogan, of course, and Randy Savage and all the old school cats. Uh, um, yeah, we used to, I used to watch that religiously with my dad. It was like, a, of course I did. Mexican. <laughs> so I'm always curious because you were an actual wrestler. How did wrestlers view professional wrestling? I mean, we say it's fake. Everyone says it's <laughs> fake. Yeah, but um, um, I don't, I don't, th I still didn't judge it. Like it was like, it was for me, it's like, I realized it was entertainment. It was theater. It was still fun to watch. Like who cares? So uh, just uh, this week, as a matter of fact, it was announced that the Los Angeles Dodgers have signed Shohei Otani to seven, a $700 million contract. Um, how in the entertainment industry, because he's repped by CAA. Mm -hmm. So he's got entertainment. Uh, he, he's got agents that are, you know, representing movies, uh, actors and all that stuff. What is the inter the reaction in the entertainment world to Shohei Otani? Is there already a Shohei fever going on? Are we going to see more actors at Dodger Stadium to check out Shohei? Probably. Yeah. I mean, well, one, the Dodgers are probably just going to say they're going to give a bunch of stuff away to actors and give them good spots. And especially if they have movies and TV shows coming out, they're going to feature them. We're gonna, uh, the first pitch and then stuff like that. Of course, of course. And, um, the Dodgers are fun to watch. I think the first time um, I, I'm a, I, I am a sports fan. I just don't really take the time to watch a ton of sports. Cause I, I kind of rather be watching movies or I'd rather do something outside or, doing something else i just don't it just just uh, i just don't take the time um um but to go to a game it's different to go to basketball football wrestling all all the things uh, uh baseball it's it's a lot more fun hockey's fun to watch um uh, la football club i'm really into those guys right now um 
Um, but yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I think it will, we will see a lot of people. Everyone, everyone wants to be really kind of the first time I watched a full game since I was a kid because the Braves were my team when I was a kid. Um, yeah. Uh, fun, funny from Wyoming. I don't, for some reason, it was a Braves. I think that's what friends like the Braves. It's, it's because of the Superstation, right? It's because of the TBS because oh. they were on the TV all the time. Yeah, 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 all the time. All the time. Who was the big ones in, at the Braves when they were like back in the seven, nine, 80s and 90s? It was uh um, you, you had Ron Gant, you had yeah. uh Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz. Wasn't yeah. Dion with them too for a minute? Yeah, Dion played for them yeah. for a while. David Justice. If that's, that's who I'm thinking of, David Justice, yeah. Um, yeah, I used to watch it. I used to watch it all the time. But the the World Series, the last that won probably five years ago, something like that. That was just an epic, epic World Series with the Dodgers. Um are you are the one with the Astros? Is that the one you're talking about? So, yeah. 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 It was just an epic series of the drama of it. You know, I saw Annie and, 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 and Eva Longoria throwing out first pitches. Were you a part of the, the first pitches when you guys were promoting? Yeah. Hunt? yeah. 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 We were. Um, I have a, I have a shirt. I almost wore it just to kind of. <laughs> To throw you off as a Houston as an Astros or who yeah, this? because I saw one where you guys were in Houston and I was yeah. just like, Oh, that would have been that would have been probably funny thing is, is so like I'm I live half the time in Austin. Like oh, I'm you? Okay. yeah, so like I'm been there for the last 10 years. So it's like I'm suited, I'm like half Californian, half Texan, half Wyoming. Um, so like I I if you want to bring me to a game, like I'll wear your jersey too. <laughs> so can you explain to me why uh, the, the the term keep Austin weird? Like what what's so weird about Austin? All I hear about Austin is it's, it's a great place. It's super expensive. It's gone expensive, yeah. Um uh I mean my property values tripled in the past 5 <laughs> years. <laughs> uh, which is great. Um it's just like the fun, weird, quirky stuff about Austin is, is it's, well, it's a very kind of purple city, right? Like there's, it's very liberal. It has this liberal beliefs, but it's still Texas, yeah. right? <laughs> it's still Texas. And, um, and there's an oddity about that on its own. You know what I mean? There's the artists, there's the musicians, there's, um, um, just the, the, uh, the tech there's, it's blown up now. Like Austin's completely different city than it was 10 years ago when I first moved there. Um, but it's, uh, it's what I mean by keep Austin weird is like what happens. And Matthew McConaughey said it very well. Welcome everybody. Like, come on, be part of Austin, be part of Texas. We welcome you. Just don't try to turn it into something that you left. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? So like if you're leaving California for a reason, for, the taxes, the politics, and this and that. Just don't try to turn Austin into what you just ran away from. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's a there's a reason why people come to, to Texas. And if you're like trying to kill the weird, trying to kill whatever like the special part of Austin and like Texas has its own issues. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Like, there's a lot of shit about Texas that, that's not right. But the same thing you could say about California. That's true. That's true. Last one for you, Jesse. Um, we are very big on the taco culture here. We we mm -hmm. love our tacos, and uh, especially the fact that you know you can literally go to the street corner now. It seems everybody just puts up their own little puesto and they start selling tacos. So we want to know what is your favorite taco, and where do you go to get that taco? Honestly, I cook a lot, so like I, I make. Most of my tacos, but anywhere there's like a good birria taco, okay. I love I love birria. Um, I don't have any spots though. I can't I couldn't I couldn't name any spots. I have a a whole list on my Instagram save folders like taco spots that I've been meaning to try. Um, but yeah, anywhere there's a good any good good birria, we can uh, give you a recommendation. We're big fans of Teddy's Red Tacos. Uh, you get some consomme with it, uh, mm -hmm. and that guy. A very similar story to Flamin' Hot. He started with one little, and now he's opening up shops everywhere. But Teddy's Red Tacos, are, um, they're delicious. Uh, are you a flour or a um, corn tortilla, man? So I don't, I'm very, I eat very clean, so I don't really do either one. I uh -huh. either have them make a costra out of the cheese, and I'll just eat it with the cheese, right? Okay. Or I'll just, 
I'll 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 scrape the the costra cheese out of the 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 thing and I'll eat it like that. It's like I'm I'm weird, you know. Like I make my living in front of a camera, so like I I'm kind of watching it pretty. Okay, pretty. so that's a conscious decision. I I didn't know if that was the Wyoming way of life where you no, eat that's you me. clean. That's just me. But if I were to have just one, I would probably do flour, like a okay. good homemade flour tortilla. My mom makes bomb tortillas. I brought I brought like two dozen tortillas from Wyoming because my friends wanted some and I gave some to some of my friends like, bro, how can you not eat this? <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, Jesse, we want to thank you. Uh, you've been very gracious with your time. We want to wish uh, Flamin' Hot uh, best of luck uh, the rest of the campaign here. Obviously, you guys can watch it if you haven't seen it already. Uh, it's been av available for a while on Hulu, on Disney+. Plus. But uh, we're rooting for you, man, and we'd love to see uh, whatever, any future projects that are coming out soon that we can see you in. Um, even I just did another movie called Alexander and a Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Road Trip for Disney. Okay. Um, and that'll be out, I want to say spring. So I don't really know quite yet, but I think it's going to spring and, and the studio is really excited about it. And it's just a really cute family film. So like, I'm, you know, I'm doing family films now, I guess. <laughs> so are you and Eva going to be uh, De Niro and Scorsese now? Is that, is that what's I, going I, on? I think so. But she didn't direct it. Her and I played mom and dad. Oh, okay. You, you right. guys are just acting in it. Okay. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. But yeah, you know, I'll be I'll be her De Niro. I ain't got no problem with that. <laughs> there you have it. Where can our listeners, our follow, our viewers, where can they follow you on the social media to get some more Jesse Garcia news? Um, I mean, I don't post very much, but Instagram, Jesse John Garcia, and that's okay. really kind of about it. I don't I don't really use X anymore. <laughs> all right that's that's for another episode jesse we'll get into that one but thank you very much for joining us my pleasure thank you this episode of the bleed loss podcast has been brought to you by betonline.ag where the game starts <laughs>